So before I introduce our topic for this video, I want to tell you a little story. Uh, back when I was uh, first training to become a physics teacher to get my license, um, I had to take a physics exam to prove that I knew enough physics in order to teach physics in high school. And I figured I had a mechanical engineering degree, I could just walk into that and take it just fine. Well, I didn't realize I should have probably prepared a little bit and looked to see what the topics were because there was a whole section on modern physics. And as a mechanical engineer, I never had to take a modern physics class and I, I hadn't. I had never been in a modern physics class before and I didn't know really anything in that topic. Um, but I was given an equation sheet and uh, all of the, the numbers on there had units. And I was able to pass that section, which was required. You had to pass every single section of the exam to pass. I was able to pass that section with a minimum score using nothing but dimensional analysis. So even though I didn't know any of the topics at that point, I, I do now, I've studied them now, um, but at that point I didn't know any of the equations. I was able to figure out which units went with which equations by studying the units themselves. And that's the skill I want to teach you here today. Dimensional analysis, the way that you've seen it probably before, has been just in terms of conversions. So especially useful um, when we're doing uh, fractional conversions. But here, if I wanted to convert miles into kilometers, I know that my conversion factor is mile one mile for every 1.609 kilometers. I start with my 26.2 miles. And then I'm going to multiply it by a conversion factor in the form of a fraction. So you probably did this, uh, especially in chemistry class, using stoichiometry. I'm going to call it train tracks. We're multiplying it by these conversion um, fractions. We're going to put miles on the bottom in this case so that miles cancels out. Um, since it's essentially on the top and the bottom, the miles cross off. None of the numbers do, just the units themselves do. Now, the only unit that's left over is kilometers. So if I multiply 26.2 times 1.609 over 1, which is the same thing as just multiplying, I'll end up with 42.2 kilometers. I can do the same thing with fractions. So if I wanted to take 35 miles per hour here written in the IB format of negative exponents and convert that to meters per second, here's a conversion factor that I'll probably need. Um, I'm going to start out by splitting this up into a fraction. So 35 miles per hour is the same thing as writing 35 miles for every one hour. Just write that and put the hours on the bottom. Now, I need to convert miles into meters, but I also need to convert hours into seconds. So there's several different conversions that need to happen here. And dimensional analysis will help me know where to put on the bottom and what to put on the top. So here, I can, can take this one mile for every 1,609 meters and set it up so that miles, in this case, is on the bottom and meters is on the top because miles was on the top. So if I do it this way, I can cross off the miles. If I stopped here, and I could, I would end up with an answer that's in meters per hour, which is interesting, but not what I'm looking for. I now need to convert that hours into seconds because I want meters per second. Now, you might not know off the top of your head, how many seconds there are in an hour, but you probably do know how many minutes there are in an hour. So I can convert hours to minutes, knowing that there's 60 minutes for every hour. I'm gonna set up my conversion fraction, putting hours on the top. So one hour for every 60 minutes. I do that because hours was on the bottom and now I can cancel them out. So hours cancels with hours. If I stopped here, I'd have meters per minute, but I know that there's 60 seconds in a minute. I'll put minutes on the top, seconds on the bottom so that minutes cancels out. And I'm left with this string of fractions being multiplied together. A shortcut here is you can ignore the ones in this case. So basically it's the same thing as taking 35 times 1609 divided by 60 divided by 60 again, and you get 15.6 meters per second. So Something that you may not have used for conversions before is converting with exponents. Now, if I have a meter stick, and I have one right here, I know that there are 100 centimeters in one meter. But it turns out that there are not 100 centimeters squared in a square meter. 
If I think about this meter sig being one dimensional, a squared centimeter and a squared meter would be two dimensions. It'd be like if I had a square that's one meter on the bottom and one meter on the side and one big square here. That would be one square meter. Now a square centimeter is actually something really, really tiny. Um, so 100 would not nearly fill it up. 100 would actually just be one row here on the bottom. And then there's going to be 100 of those rows. So we end up with 100 times 100 squared centimeters in one squared meter, which will give us 100 squared or 100, or sorry, 10,000 square centimeters in a square meter. If I extend this out and give it some depth to make it a cubic meter, now I'm going to have to take 100 and multiply it three times because I have 100 in a row, then 100 rows, and then 100 of those sheets in depth will give me 100 cubed, which is 1 million cubic cent or I should say cubic centimeters. Now, converting with exponents uh, is a similar thing that I know uh, there are 1,000 meters for every kilometer. Um, but I'm not converting kilometers to meters straight, straight away here. I'm actually converting squared kilometers to squared meters. So if I were to use just one conversion factor, that wouldn't actually cancel out. That I have kilometers squared this kilometers doesn't do the whole trick. Instead, I need another kilometers on the bottom. So I'm going to multiply it by that conversion factor again. So multiply by 1,000, multiply by 1,000 again. It's the same thing as moving the decimal three times and another three times. So I have six times to the right, which would be 50,000 squared meters. Another way that I could write this, if I wanted to save some, some space, is I could write this as 1,000 over 1 squared. It's the same thing. I could type that into my calculator exactly the same way. I could just say 0 0.5, 0 0.05 times 1,000 squared. And that also gives me 50,000 squared meters. So with that in mind, here's the general structure, but it's missing the exponents. Um, if I wanted to convert squared meters to squared feet or cubic meters to cubic feet, this is my conversion factor. One meter is 3.28 feet. If I want to do squared meters, I got to square it. If I want to do cubic meters, I have to cube it. So with that in mind, I'm going to have 53.8 squared feet in five squared meters. How many um, squared or cubic meters will you have? in five cubic, or how many cubic feet will you have in five cubic meters? If you plug that into your calculator, either doing five times 3.28 times 3.28 times 3.28, or five times 3.28 cubed, you should end up with the answer of roughly 176.4 cubic feet. So the other form of dimensional analysis, the one that was really helpful to me when I was taking that test, is by using dimensions, units, and equations kind of one and the same. If you have a formula here, um, say it's the formula for velocity, v is equal to d over t, or you have a formula d is equal to a times t. From these alone, if I know the units for these, I can tell you whether or not that formula works um, so I'm going to spread these out and then just swap in these variables for the units. The unit of velocity should be meters per, per second. Unit of distance is meters. Unit of time is seconds. So if I swap those out, I end up with an equation that says meters per second equals meters over seconds. That totally works. That's the same thing on both sides. It might be in different colors and presented a little bit differently, but that's the same equivalent unit. Now, if I do the same thing down below, distance is meters, acceleration is meters per second squared. We'll talk about that more this unit. And time is seconds. I get something that looks like this. I can simplify this a little bit. Um, I got second squared on the bottom multiplied by seconds. One of these seconds is going to go away if I cancel that out. 
So I end up with meters is equal to meters per second. Now that that's not an equality. That's not the same thing. So we would say, no, this equation is not valid. Um, so just by looking at the variables and knowing what units those variables would be, I can tell you whether or not an equation is going to be valid or not. Now, right now, that's not super useful. The equations that we're going to be given will be valid um, if they're in our data booklet. But um, we will see some scenarios where we're having to choose like how these variables go together, where this will become a really useful skill. It's also a useful skill if we're trying to figure out units that we don't know. So for example, I know that the unit of mass is kilograms. I know that the unit of velocity is meters per second. If I didn't remember what the unit of momentum was, all I have to do is plug in these units in the equation for momentum. Momentum is going to be given to us as mass times velocity, kilograms times meters per second. If I were to present that in the IB format, kilograms, meters, seconds, the minus one. Constants also have a unit. Uh, if I see this equation later on this year, this is the equation, the universal law of gravitation, which says that the force of gravity is equal to some constant, universal gravitation constant, times one of the masses times the other mass divided by the distance squared. I can figure out what unit this constant has to have if I rearrange that equation to solve for g. So I just, I've rearranged it here. Now g is equal to f times d squared divided by mass times mass. Then I can plug in, instead of these variables, their corresponding units. I end up with, instead of force, newtons, instead of distance, meters, instead of the masses, kilograms. And that simplifies down to newtons times meters squared divided by kilograms squared. If I were to present that using negative exponents, that turns into newtons times meters squared divided by kilograms squared. The last piece that I want to talk about in this intro video is scientific notation. This is something that I hope you have been exposed to, should be pretty familiar to you at this point. Um, but scientific notation is going to be used a lot in this class to talk about very big numbers and very small numbers. If I didn't want to write all these zeros, I can write it out in scientific notation. Normalized scientific notation basically says that you take this number here and then place a decimal so that the number is now between 1 and 10. Um, so that decimal that I place is going to be 8.9. And then you just multiply it times 10 to the some exponent. Now that exponent indicates how many places that decimal has moved from its original spot. So here I move it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven places um, to make it that big number. So I, I represent it as 8.9 times 10 to the seven. We can do this for numbers down below as well. This number here, 750 billion, turns into 7.5 times 10 to the 11th. And this number here turns into 8.759 times 10 to the 9th. Now on your calculator, one way that you can write this out is using an exponent key. On my calculator, this TI-83, I can say second, and then there's an EE -E symbol here. It's probably hard to see on there. Um, but basically, it just turns this into um, 8.9 E7. If I typed that in on my calculator, it's the same thing. Um, and both of these notations are accepted if you were to present them to me on a test. Um, but where the real benefit is, is typing it in your calculator. That E takes the place of the times 10 to the. Um, it's a lot fewer keystrokes, and it makes order of operations work out really nicely later on. We can present these others in the same format, just substituting that E for the times 10 to the. Same thing for small numbers, only the big difference here is instead of using uh, positive exponents, we use negative exponents. So here, this 0 0.00125 turns into 1.25, some number between 1 and 10, times 10 to the negative third. We move the decimal three places. We can do this down below as well. 
this number here turns into 8.255 times 10 to the negative seventh because we moved the decimal seven places. This number down below is actually exactly the same value. There's just an extra zero here, which indicates that that number must be significant. Think back to your chemistry days. Um, so here we would just hold on to that zero um, because there was a reason that it was presented before. There's a reason that it's presented now. Um, Again, we can use this E notation if we want to take the place of the times 10. Um, so we end up with 1.25 E negative 3.